How'd you do that? I'm the Batman. Keep an eye on it for me, kid. I think the intention was to bring together a, a new group of talent to sort of give the new Batman sort of a fresh take. And uh, it was uh, very daunting, very difficult to uh, follow in the footsteps of the great Batman the Animated Series. As we'd all get together and I'd talk with people, we, we sat there and we go, what, what things can we change and what things shouldn't we mess with? I think you could mess with villains, I think you could mess with side characters, but I don't think it's the best idea to change Batman. What was important to us in doing the new series, The Batman, was to show Batman as he hadn't been seen before at a point in his career that hadn't been the subject of the prior series. So in our show, Batman is young. He's maybe Batman year three. He's not at the full peak of his strength and his talents. He's still vulnerable and learning how to grow into the dark night he ultimately becomes. Well, some of the influences we, we looked at early on, uh, obviously, I think, if you look at the show, you can see that there's some uh, Japanese anime influence. I thought that is just something that would be fun to play with and really look for new ways of presenting the classic elements. How can we make them fresh and entertaining to a new audience as well as those of us that are familiar with the character? When redesigning a new show with Batman, there are a lot of things you need to keep and some things that you can get rid of. I made the ears shorter because that just seems more boxer-like, more enclosed. He's not quite the detective yet, so he relies more on his fighting. He has the yellow oval back, and we went to the retro colors. It's just a different take rather than having the big brow and the, the long pointy nose. <laughs> The Batman? What if I hadn't been decent? You're never decent, Joker. The dramatic dilemma posed by the series is at the beginning of year three, he's cleaned up Gotham, but almost as a result of this new Dark Knight, suddenly a new breed of supervillain has risen out of the darkness. So as our series begins, he's meeting Joker, Penguin, Mr. Freeze, Catwoman, all these crazies, you know, for the very first time. The Joker in our series began with a crazy drawing that Jeff did that everybody kind of loved but was such a radical departure from the classic character that, you know, it, it was very inspiring for all of us. The Joker is a crazy person who's intelligent and is like the nemesis of Batman. He has a white face because it's bleached out because of his accident. So if he's crazy, I just want to continue that frame of thinking. He's from a mental institute, so he has the long sleeves on. He doesn't have shoes on. His hair is still green. So from, from the, the read of the audience, I think it still reads pretty much like Joker. Bruce Wayne, king of the castle, ruler of the roost. Have we met? Cobblepot, Oswald Cobblepot. Penguin, we, we thought, even though Penguin's an old soul, in our minds, he's Bruce Wayne's age. You know, he's late 20s, early 30s. We sort of saw him as the anti-Bruce, you know, where Joker is Batman's nemesis. Penguin in our series really has it out for Bruce Wayne. Why? Because Bruce Wayne has everything the Penguin doesn't have. And on top of that, we just threw in that, <laughs> why doesn't uh, Penguin know martial arts himself, you know? There are sort of examples of that in, in Hong Kong cinema, of the sort of portly character that suddenly whips out all these moves. Why not? You know, it just suddenly made the character come to life for us in a new way. You are not welcome here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Freeze will do. Mr. Freeze is an interesting one. Um, we purposefully set out to not make Mr. Freeze as he was in Batman the Animated Series. Really the main reason is Heart of Ice is such a classic and so many fans favorite Batman episode. Why touch that? So, you know, our choice was to go the way we did with Freeze, you know, make him a little bit more of a mutant, a little bit more of a straight ahead villain. The biggest difference with Mr. Freeze is that as opposed to being uh, sort of a humanoid character encased in glass, that fires ice from a gun, our Mr. Freeze internally produces ice and fires the ice directly from his hand. I think across the board, we wanted to take villains who were typically strange variations on like crime bosses and sort of make this show less of a crime show 
and more of a superhero show. This show is so much fun, it's incredible. Everybody involved uh, loves the character, from voice talent to artists to writers. There's a great sense of responsibility and also a great sense of honor in even being entrusted with this character. It's just an amazingly gratifying experience. It's pretty much a kid's dream to get to redesign like the Bat Universe. You look back and you just see a, a fresh take on things, which I think is really cool. With this collection of the first year, you see what we've accomplished in the first season and the story arc that carries through the first 13. So this is a great start of the Batman series. We're going to continue to make it even better for many seasons to come. <laughs>
Whatever he's frozen, he can disintegrate with his special ice pick. Fittingly, Mr. Freeze's favorite thing to steal is ice. Another word for diamonds. Detective Yin has done her homework. While in the Amazon, Bane volunteered for some physical enhancements. Bane can access his incredible size and strength by a control on his arm. He was hired to prevent the Batman from disrupting organized crime. Bane is so big and powerful, the Batman had to adapt to his size with the use of the Batbot. The Batman is a vigilante who seems to strike fear in most criminals. Although the crime rate has dropped significantly in the three years the Batman has roamed Gotham's streets, it is illegal to take the law into your own hands. Batman a criminal? Listed among the worst villains in Gotham? Gosh, I'm hurt. Police have had very few close encounters with the Batman. Freeze! Little is known about him, but he's very adept at combat and always carries a wide array of gadgets. He seems to know where and when crimes are taking place. All attempts to arrest him have proved futile. The Batman seems to have all the resources needed to stop crime. I joined the Gotham City Police Department to find out who is the Batman. I will not rest until I have found out his true identity. Well, I think I've seen enough of the case files. Time to take to the streets. I can only hope that someday, the Gotham Police and I will exist on friendlier terms. Months and months of detective work, and I still don't know the true identity of the Batman. I've gotten a tip that the Batman has been spotted outside of Gotham City at the Mattel Design Center. Hmm, the people at Mattel have been working in league with the Batman to create action figures, vehicles, and interactive toys. If I learn how they make it all work, I might just discover the true identity of the Batman in the process. Someone there must know who he is. Well, well, well. What do we have here? Ah, Detective Yen. We meet again. Let's get down to business. Where's the Batman? Uh, okay, this is not a good time. I'm extremely busy. Maybe perhaps my designers can help. Okay, Batman, I'm gonna get you. Uh, take that, Joker, take that. Oh, oh, Detective Yen, can I help you? Okay, Wolfie, come clean. I know you've seen the Batman. No, I haven't seen the Batman. Do you know his true identity? Nobody knows who the Batman is. Then how do you explain all the toys that look like him? Maybe you'd have better luck if you talked to people who designed the toys. Are you Steed's son, one of the designers of the Batman toys? Yes. Detective Yin, Gotham City Police Department. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? Uh, no, 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 not at all. So tell me, how do you come up with your designs? When we try to come up with the ideas for the toys and stuff like that, we go look at all the different missions that Batman does and all the uh, bad guys he has to fight. And then from then, we kind of figure out what kind of vehicles he needs, things like the Batmobile, the Batjet, the Batcycle. The Batman has a lot of suits like Rocket Shield suit, an anti-free suit, a battle wing suit, and a Batbot suit, which is like a big robot suit that he can climb into and fight all the bad guys with. There's got to be more designers around here somewhere. Yes, can I help you? What do you do here? I draw and design, I'd say, pretty much all of the Batman animated figures. Have you ever seen the Batman? The room was dark. Someone was in the shadows. So then you have seen him? OK, OK, OK. I saw the Batman once, but I don't know who he was. Do you know where he is now? Why don't you go ask the sculptor? Hi, can I help you? 
Detective Yin, Gotham PD. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? No, not at all. So what does a sculptor do? They give us a two-dimensional reference, sometimes photographs, sometimes drawings, and we'll make a clay sculpt based on that reference. Then we'll make a mold from that, and then from the mold we'll pour a plastic piece, and with that plastic piece we can take it and paint it and articulate it and make an action figure out of it. If you've sculpted the Batman, then you must have seen him. I haven't seen him myself personally, but I've, I've seen shadows, sometimes a cape slip around the corner, but I haven't seen him with my own eyes, no. He's hiding something. I'll have to search for more clues. Hey, is that the Batman on your computer? Yeah, come on in. So what do we have here? Well, right here I have a uh, program that allows me to virtually sculpt a figure or anything that I want. I could turn the figure and see it from any angle. Also, this has force feedback, which when I push on it, it actually gives me resistance. One of the things I can do is say like I don't like his ear, I can uh, just take this tool Carve it, carve it away, so it's gone. Since it's a computer, I can say, bam, it's back. Oh, another dead end. Wait a minute, I'm picking up a bat signal from somewhere in the building. Detective Yin, Gotham City Police, may I ask you some questions? Okay. Why are you generating a bat signal? In watching the Batman do his work, people have realized that he has a lot of high-tech items. And what we're trying to do is at least give you a glimpse into some of the items that Batman would, would normally have. How do you explain how these toys are so technically advanced? We're trying to push as much high-tech uh, technology into our toys as possible, much like what Wayne Industry does for the Batman. What do you know about the Batwave TV-activated devices? We've taken uh, the great ideas that we have from the designers, and we've enabled them with Veil technology that allows the toy to react to things that happen with the uh, television. The television will give signals to the device, and the device will actually unlock features and you'll understand a little bit more about the arsenal that Batman has. No one seems to know where the Batman is. Do you have any idea? If you find the Batman, uh, I'm interested in, in seeing what they've done to the Batmobile. What was that? I heard the Batman. Where is he? Oh, you mean this? I'm the Batman. How did you get the Batman's voice on your computer? Any toy that is made here has sound that we provide for it. If we have an action figure, say, a particular voice, that character will come into our studio, we'll create a script for that product, and then they come in and they record with us. When the Batman came in to record, did you get a good look at him? It was dark. I couldn't see all that well, but he did leave this. I found the location of the other Batwave communicator. Aha! I've discovered the secret location of Mattel's prototypes of the Batman toys. The Batman must be close. Detective Yin here. The Batman has been spotted back in Gotham. I'm on my way. That was close. She's gone. Nothing, she suspects a thing. Gotcha. Good luck chasing the Joker. All right. All right. When we were designing his, his technological gadgets, uh, we just like to take some of the traditional uh, elements that he's always had and just add little flourishes based on kind of what we know is is possible today technologically and pushing it a little bit more so that it makes Batman that much more fantastic. The Batcave is just filled with technology that's maybe five years ahead of us now. So you could look at it and go, I, I could figure out what that does or I have something that's close to that now. He has his Batwave computer which connects into every computer in the world so he gets information first. The Batwave uh, technology is absolutely extraordinary for him to be able to tap into every, virtually everything in Gotham the way he does. You know, you know it's some, some cutting edge stuff. Bruce Wayne, in, in amongst all of his other training, he um, definitely focused on like, criminology and you know that sort of lab science in that area has made himself an expert in that area. 
He definitely understands chemistry at a very high level, I think on the level of any professional chemist or you know, maybe even beyond. So definitely in this story, he approaches the problem of the vampires in a scientific way. Bruce Wayne is absolutely a man of science. You know, for one thing, he has all these resources. What he can't do himself, he has engineers at Wayne Industries doing without even knowing they're helping the Batman out, of course. That, that's his big secret, and that's the fun of the character. No, Joker! <gasps> what? The most fun we had, of course, coming up with one of Dracula's minions was Joker himself. We thought, okay, well, we're gonna first pair Joker and Penguin against Batman. That's big, but we've seen that before. We're gonna also include Dracula in this. That's even bigger, but we need to push it just a little bit more. What else can we do? How about if Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker, turns into a vampire, and ironically, Batman has to save him in order to save the rest of Gotham City. I am his vessel. I like him to be more frightening than I do funny. I like the perils to be more real, the jeopardy to be more suspenseful, and I like there to be a feeling of danger whenever he's on the screen. Let me put it this way. To me, there's like nothing scarier than two things, vampires and clowns. So what if you put the two together? You know what I'm saying? Really creepy. And we think that Joker is absolute fun as a vampire. Um, and it's really scary. Some of the scariest moments in this movie are Joker with fangs. The more the Batman tries to protect Gotham, the more Gotham fears him. I think one of the most interesting things about the Batman character is that he's, in a sense, two people and he's kind of divided and in the series we tell the story of the early years of Batman and Bruce Wayne sort of getting used to filling those shoes you know it, it's a role that he's just growing into. It's a difficult uh, challenge for Bruce Wayne to manage his life with the Batman thing being so dominant in his life. He wants to have a life but Batman is the most important thing in his life. I'm sorry Vicky. Would you believe I have to wrap this up? He's also a billionaire. So he has opportunities that real people don't have, and he is torn in a direction of using it for his enjoyment. He can't. He's got a responsibility. He's got an obligation. He's got an obligation to his parents' memory. He's got an obligation to the city of Gotham and the millions of people who live there. Give it up, Joker. We think of him as a superhero, but in fact, he's not really a superhero, he's a, he's a man. And the thing that's intriguing about him is he's a human that has trained himself to the ultimate level of human potential, mentally and physically. The style of this version of the Batman uh, was changed um, because we were trying to create a younger looking Batman. The approach that I took when designing him was that I gave him sort of like a boxer's face um, he, has, he has more of like a crooked nose. The biggest uh, sweeping change would probably be I changed his cowl from being, you know, the profile you could see is his brow and his nose. So it's more like a bowl. It's like a cereal bowl. If you want to make the Batman cowl for yourself, you just take a cereal bowl, spray paint it black, make sure it fits on your head, and you just put two big eye slits. That's, that's really all it is. Bruce Wayne uses Wayne Industries as his hub for cutting edge technology that he then uses to bring into the Batcave. And uh, one of the things that we'll see in the movie is the SL5 uh, solar device. I made this thing that's very innocuous looking and you can't tell what it does until it opens up. It has to look interesting but not so interesting that everyone's eye goes to it when the scene starts. It's meant to simulate just sunlight. So when it opens up, it looks like you're watching the horizon, the sun come over the horizon, and it just opens up. The story of Batman really begins when young Bruce Wayne witnesses his parents uh, killed uh, while he's nine years old. It's a tragic story, and the weed toyed with tweaking it. And ultimately, you don't mess with, you know, Bible stories. That's classic. As he grows up, he's haunted by the memories, which ultimately lead him to uh, train to not only avenge his parents' death and find those who are responsible for it, but also to uh, save 
the city from all manner of villains and evildoers. When you're Dracula or a vampire, you can do one of two things. You can, you know, kill people and drain them of blood, or, you know, you can turn them into your own minions. And so we thought, wouldn't this be cool? Dracula, his ultimate goal is to take over Gotham and create an army of vampires. Ah, dead guys don't do that! The Lost Ones were a lot of fun to come up with, and uh, we really wanted to make them as scary as we could. Uh, within reason. Obviously, it was very much fun to show people of everyday walks of life turning into vampires. One of the most fun things was the little girl that turns around and you don't expect her to be a vampire. And it's just one of those images that's fun from that, you, that you've seen in horror movies and so on that we had a lot of fun putting that in. Everything we do for the show, we want it to be unique to our show. Um, so, you know, graveyards, they're green. If you go to them, they're green, they're gated. They're one level, pretty boring places. So we tried to make it hilly, a lot scarier. We want a lot more geometry in it, uh, better ways to frame frame the scene. So they're like, they're crooked graves. They're all on different levels. There's mausoleums. Everything's just off kilter. It's a very uncomfortable place. I think the style and the look and the mood of Gotham Graveyard is pretty much in keeping with Gotham in general. Our Gotham of the series is a very gothic, um, you know, almost medieval place. The, uh, you know, the place is just dripping with ooze and dripping with history. We wanted to be a Gotham no one's seen before, but we didn't. again, we didn't want to make it so foreign. People feel like they're stepping into a world that they're like, what is this? What's going on? Are we not on Earth? So we mixed in uh, some Prague, the Byzantine architecture in Prague, and like 1940s Chicago, the urban feel of those years. We developed a, a new look for Gotham City that incorporated all of elements of all the great cities of, of the United States. There's a little bit of um, New York in there, there's a little bit of Chicago in there, certainly most of the eastern cities. There's a little bit of Philadelphia in there, um, and it's all created into this amalgam of a gothic sort of old world city. My hopes for the character of Vicki Vale uh, was through her to convey the sacrifices that a hero must make um, in his life um, in order to protect innocent people. I'm sorry, Vicky. Not right now. She's a classic character from the comics, you know, a love interest, a uh, uh, the, the journalist. And we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if she sort of challenges who he is, and, and he has this reluctance to, to get involved. You know, Bruce Wayne puts on this Bachelor Act for the public so that they won't suspect him. I always said Batman is far more attractive and enticing than Superman. Superman is just so goody two shoes. Batman is dark, it's what every woman should stay away from, the dark brooding man, but it's so appealing. She's smart, she's funny, she's beautiful, she's capable. Um, all of the things that, that Bruce Wayne needs in his life. Um, however, if he were to have that, that's somebody that would make him vulnerable to his enemies, and he recognizes that. And so he sacrifices his own happiness, his own needs for the greater good of Gotham City and subsequently the world. In creating the Dracula for this series, we wanted to have the essence of all the Draculas, or what people see as Dracula, the iconic Dracula, because it's important in the story that we capture these two myths against each other, Batman and Dracula. I like the Bela Gossi, the Christopher Lee Draculas, they, they read as a Dracula to me. So we went for that kind of look. To make him the opposite of Batman, we gave him a black cape, but the inside is red, whereas Batman's is blue. We cut up the cape so it, it gives nice silhouettes. He's pretty pale, he has piercing blue eyes, uh, as far as his transformation to bestial Dracula, he gets the, all the weird changes in the face, but we went a little bit more severe with his face rather than just the forehead getting bigger. We went and made it more bony and sharp and a little bit scarier looking. And he's a lot more relentless in the way he attacks. We take this as a, a monster movie, and at the end he becomes the monster that we're all scared of. I have been at rest for quite some time. Transylvania has changed. Oh, oh, Dark One, you're not in Transylvania anymore. This is Gotham City. The main thing I think that was very important for us was to make the character feel as classic and sort of mythic and legendary as we have tried to do with Batman. Um, and so I think we drew on what are the elements that make Dracula feel like Dracula and feel 
classic and you feel like it's the real Dracula there and that's kind of what we were going for. The main thing was to have that very old European nobleman kind of feel to Dracula. To me that is the essence of the character. We toyed a lot with Dracula being in a more modern context when he comes into the modern world. I think in the scope of the story, that's sort of Dracula's goal. He's going to emerge from the underground and become a member of high society. The key attributes or powers that we looked for in Dracula were mostly that he needed to be more powerful than Batman so we can make it exciting. How's Batman going to beat this guy? And there's a bestiality to Dracula when he feeds, when he gets that look in his eye. But there's simply that superhuman strength that's Dracula being able to fling Batman 50 feet across the room, you know, without breaking a sweat. There's a simple, primal power to Dracula. I will drain you dry and use your cape as a dinner napkin. When we were designing the Tomb of Dracula, we want to give everyone something really different to look at. So we elevated it off the ground. It's now suspended by chains, enormous chains. It looks like really formidable when you first see it, like, oh, he ain't never getting out of there. We thought, well, Gotham Cemetery and his sort of cavern underneath the crypt is Dracula's own Batcave. It actually made a lot of sense because in our series, Batman has tunnels that lead out of the Batcave and go throughout the city. He's got all these secret entrances and exits that uh, you know he drives the Batcave out of. And then we thought it was cool at the moment where he figures out that Dracula is doing the same thing. As you notice, the insane people that we depict in the, in the bingo sequence uh, are sort of exaggerated and almost uh, cartoony in a sense. What we were going for was, again, a sense of unease and a, a sort of a, a creepy feel, and that was just another element that added to that. It's oftentimes hard to tell what their goals, their ultimate goals are. They're not just criminals who are, you know, robbing banks for the money. They're often motivated by things that are, quite frankly, insane. Is every single villain in Gotham criminally insane? Well, not necessarily, but we've sort of, uh, you know, split the difference. Arkham Asylum is, it's where we put our bad guys. Arkham Asylum, as I recall from the comic books, was already in existence um, in Gotham City prior to the first appearance of Batman and certainly some of these super criminals. Artistically, I really wanted it to be something that we haven't seen before. Um, so we got together and we ended up talking about orange walls. It, it's a, it has a warm, a uh, musty feeling to it. Wanted to go to a place that seems really warm and uncomfortable. This place is just a crazy place for crazy people, and they're never happy there. Tweet, tweet. Penguin's ancestors were royalty, and poor Penguin has lost the Cobblepot fortune, and now he's, he's forever trying to live up to that. I'll have you know, sir, I am a Cobblepot, and Cobblepots do not serve. And we thought, okay, Penguin, he's kind of tricky because he looks like a banker. You know, he's an old man in a suit. You know, he's a crime boss. But, you know, what makes him, you know, more interesting? And I hit on this idea that Penguin, or Oswald Cobblepot, as his real name is, is the anti-Bruce Wayne. He's the guy who doesn't have the good looks, doesn't have the money, which he's, you know, constantly whining about for our series. To us, it was the perfect uh, indignity to put him through is to make him Dracula's manservant. I'm Penguin. I'll be your server. Knock, knock. Penguin's umbrella is definitely a classic part of the Penguin character. I think he's always had umbrellas that turn into helicopters and that sort of thing. There's the copter umbrella, there's the flamethrower umbrella, there's the, uh, you know, ninja chain umbrella, and so uh, he's got uh, quite the umbrella collection. You know. We have that in the series, but not in the feature. In the feature, you see him use basically his blade that pops out of the end. And that's about all he does with it, because shortly after that, he's turned into Dracula's minion. It can, you know, turn into a blade that can saw through, through even metal and so on. It's, it can be a pretty uh, versatile device. How is Penguin going to learn about this hidden mob treasure? So we came up with, with this device playing bingo. Bingo, that's a grandma thing. Let's not play it like a prison. Let's stay true to the sort of classic asylum thing. And this is somebody's idea of recreation time. So we, we, we thought it was very amusing. And, uh, and, but mostly it was a device to get 
penguin in proximity to someone else where he could learn about this mob treasure. Arkham Asylum became the natural place to send a lot of these criminals once Batman would defeat them. Arkham Asylum in our series is almost a character in and of itself. It's probably the next significant uh, location other than the Batcave. We wanted to give it sort of a tough edge. And so when you look at the guards, they're wearing like knee-high boots, they're wearing goggles. You know, you get the sense that this is just a, a messy place to work. You can understand why people just want to get out of there. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a scary place, um, and no one's very nice there. Joker's weapons are so much fun because they're toys, and I like that, that sick sort of contrast between these are innocent things that wind up being really deadly. We've done a lot of different ones in the series, playing cards that he throws like ninja stars and stuff like that. Uh, the electric joy buzzer was one that we had just somehow hadn't had a chance to do, even though we've done several Joker episodes in the series, and so it was our chance to uh, finally get it into the movie, and uh, in a good way that plays out in a couple of different scenarios. News reports are calling them the lost ones. The police think they're missing persons, but I know the truth. Dracula has invaded Gotham City and is turning its citizens into vampires. To become vampire is to heighten all of one's senses. As the Batman, I have sworn to preserve life. But if I'm to uphold this oath, I must discover a way to reverse Dracula's fiendish handiwork. After extensive research, I've identified the key superstitions surrounding the legend of Dracula. Now, using the unparalleled analytical power of the Batwave, we must unearth the facts behind these superstitions, because it's only with the power of science that we can defeat Dracula and save the Lost Ones. Superstition. Dracula originally comes from Transylvania. Fact. Writer Bram Stoker's character Count Dracula lived in the Transylvanian province of Romania and was based on a warrior prince from the 1400s named Vlad Dracul. But the vampire legend actually goes back 4,000 years to the ancient land of Mesopotamia. It is here that stories originated of a creature called Lamashtu, who would feed on the blood of young men, bringing disease and nightmares to them. Superstition. Sunlight will harm a vampire. Fact. A rare blood condition called porphyria makes people extremely sensitive to sunlight. If exposed to the sun for prolonged periods, this condition will even cause the skin to blister and burn. Superstition. Vampires are repelled by the smell or touch of garlic. Fact. When eaten, raw garlic promotes good blood circulation and protects against disease. But it also causes the body to secrete a toxin that will repel a variety of insects, including blood-sucking mosquitoes. Superstition. Dracula can control people's minds by putting them under a hypnotic trance. Fact. Hypnosis, or the ability to put people in a state of increased receptivity to suggestion, has been scientifically verified. Even though the medical community has studied hypnosis for over 200 years, it still disagrees on whether its effects are caused by a chemical or psychological process in the body. Some people, however, are known to have the ability to resist hypnotic suggestion. Superstition. Vampires have superhuman strength and heightened physical speed. Fact. In emergency situations, the human body will trigger a fight or flight impulse that pushes its capabilities beyond their normal limits. In such cases, the brain releases a chemical called adrenaline that dilates the pupils and causes the heart to beat faster, pumping massive amounts of blood and oxygen to the muscles. These physical functions prepare the body to confront the danger with increased strength or run from it with amazing speed. Superstition. Being bitten by a vampire will turn you into one. Fact. This superstition may come from centuries past when common diseases were not fully understood by science. Rabies, for example, can be transmitted to human beings through animal bites. If bitten, people will exhibit symptoms such as a loss of appetite, increased sensitivity to light, and the inability to look at themselves in a mirror. Rabies can be completely cured if medical treatment is obtained immediately. Superstition. Vampires can live for thousands of years. Fact. 
While no evidence exists for such a prolonged lifespan in humans, scientific studies have found that a regular exercise program and a diet filled with balanced meals can allow a person to live over a hundred years. Join me, Batman, in my Legion of the Undead. Now that the Batwave has given me the facts behind the superstitions, I have the tools to defeat Dracula. But I must act quickly if I'm going to find an antidote for the Lost Ones. Because night has fallen over Gotham. And Dracula will not wait. <laughs>
you know, keep still and just use my voice. You know, that's just, that kind of freezes the process a little bit. When acting uh, with just your voice, it often behooves you to use your body. And, and, and actually, if you watch some of the record sessions, people will flail their arms and make faces. And, and it's actually kind of interesting to watch a lot of the cartoon guys kind of turn into cartoons themselves. I need to have uh, my body and my hands to, to flail around and, and go crazy and, and, you know, get into it. You need that. You gotta, you gotta go nuts. I, I, I find that I tend to physically change. I kind of crowd the mic and I kind of take a superhero stance and just kind of get up on the mic. You dropped your coat. You dropped your coat. I don't think I've ever used a chair during a voiceover session in 12 years. <laughs> Tom, do you want a chair? No, I don't, I don't need a chair. It's like a fishbowl and all you get is these heads. And when you do good, they go like this. And when you do bad, they go like this. <laughs> so thank you. At this point in the career of the Batman, he's been at it for a couple of three years. And he's a little wiser, a little older, and a little more sophisticated than he was in season one and season two. In season three, I think um, we were pretty happy with uh, the fact that we were able to, to you know, develop Batman's sort of maturity level. And um, by the end of the season, he's ready for new challenges. We try to work within the mythology of the Batman, and we're talking obviously 60 some years of it. And at the same time, you know, we don't want to do exactly what's done before. We look for stories that have sort of been told in the Batman world, and we try to do our spin on it. I think ultimately it's about Batman, the the prototypical loner, sort of uh, expanding his sort of circle and learning to rely on others. And, and if anything, that's the arc of season three is that uh, he comes to accept Batgirl and, and realize there's room for other people in his life. What? Wait, wait a minute. But you haven't even seen my costume. From the beginning we talked about the eventual bringing in of a partner for Batman, and, and we thought we'd do Batgirl. Why not? It'd be fun. Batman is a loner. He's very quiet. He thinks he knows it all. And and Batgirl's character in the show, she's much more sarcastic. She's always trying to, like, nudge him, you know, get him to have a little bit more of a, a good time when he's fighting crime, if that's possible. You know, adding a sidekick certainly changes the dynamic a bit. Um, Batman is still Batman, but now there's contrast. Here's this little pipsqueak girl coming in and you know, showing him that he can't do everything by himself and maybe he needs a partner to help him out. I definitely think this version of Batgirl is a lot different than a lot of the previous versions. First of all, she's a lot younger. She's a teenager. And I think with that, you know, there's a, there's a different innocence you have to bring into it. And she's not really an established superhero yet, so she's maybe not as confident in herself. There were reasons we brought Batgirl in before Robin, but um, it was something that we had to think quite a bit about, well, we're bringing her in before Robin. How can we have fun with that? How can we make it feel natural? It's nice to kind of shake things up, and and I like bringing Batgirl in first because it, it definitely adds a different dynamic to it. It's okay to show yourself. You're not on our most wanted list anymore. Force of habit. We had always planned on bringing in um, Gordon into the series uh, as his sort of police contact and friend in the police force. Putting him here was a very organic fit for us because he's Barbara's dad, so we have a lot of storylines that just pertain to their relationship with each other, um, and then her relationship to her sort of new surrogate father, Batman. So it's sort of, it was a perfect time to introduce him, I think. Our Commissioner Gordon is uh, pretty traditional. He's, he's no nonsense, and uh, you know, nobody can ruffle his feathers. You know, nobody, not Batman, not Joker, not any of these villains. Get this cuckoo to Arkham where he belongs. Bringing in the bat signal and commercial going at the same time was calculated in the sense that we needed that person the bat, that Batman has on the inside for that relationship to turn on the signal saying, you know, we Gotham need you. So that's, you know, plus in all the comics I've read, I, I can't imagine a bat signal without Commissioner Gordon. I think it'd just be strange.
Ever since Bat Breath got that signal, my lead time's been chopped in half. We try to think through how often are we going to uh, see the perennial characters like Penguin, Joker, and how often are we going to bring in a new character that we've never seen. And we always like to invent a couple of characters ourselves, so, you know, we kind of try to find a place for that. Ivy, to be exact. Poison Ivy. Our take on Poison Ivy was obviously very married to uh, our take on Batgirl. You know, we, we were going to use Poison Ivy in one of the earlier seasons, and for whatever reason, we held off and it actually worked out. You know, we just thought it would be neat to now bring her in as Barbara Gordon's friend. You know, it gave more meat to the origin. She's now a contemporary for Batgirl rather than Batman's contemporary. We did that just because the season's sort of a lot about Batgirl, so we wanted to have her have specific villains to just give her some drama in her storyline, a character arc for her to go, you know, to see her friend go bad, just like we had Batman and Ethan Bennett went bad. It's cool, it's different. I like how they did it. They start out as best friends. Later, Red. You two have fun. But uh, Pam kind of stabs her in the back and decides to go off and become Poison Ivy. On our show, we like to take lesser known villains and then try to like amplify them a little bit, maybe contemporize them a little. That's like one of our favorite things to do. Maxi Zeus was a overweight character in a toga and now he's a ironclad warrior. I think it's a fun direction to go with him. There is only room on New Olympus for one legend. I think what made it work for us was um, when we hit on the idea of a, of a politician, you know, wanting to take control and then just being so angry like a child that he just uses his big toys to take things over anyway. If you won't vote for me, I'm taking over. Thankfully, Zeus is not the only billionaire in Gotham to have built a flying machine. The Batwing was another thing that we always wanted to bring into the show. When we started talking about the Maxi Zeus story, we realized with having an airship up above Gotham and how would Batman get up there, it just naturally, organically developed that we would be able to bring in the Batwing for that story. Gearhead will be looking for the next rush, and this is one villain the Batman needs wheels to take down. Gearhead was actually a, uh, I guess, a minor Batman villain, and we actually kind of retrofitted him, and, and we took, you know, Gearhead, and, and we made him more of a speed freak and a driver, you know, a literal Gearhead. He's one of my favorite designs of the season. He's just an asymmetrical character. He's got one huge arm. I think his colors are cool. I use, like, Enter the Dragon Bruce Lee colors on him. I think it looks really cool. You traded up, Batman. That was a case where we knew we wanted to bring in the new Batmobile, so, uh, you know, we wanted to do sort of like the ultimate car chase episode, so it sort of made sense. We wanted to destroy the Batmobile and make it an event, you know, make it really dramatic. How very odd. Not odd, Alfred. Strange. Hugo Strange was one of our favorite characters, but we wanted to make him a major villain, so he was sort of the, the major baddie from the season. As it grew, you found out he was behind a lot of the bad things that were going on, so we wanted to elevate him to, a, to an A-lister as much as we could as a guy behind the scenes. He just simply enjoys manipulating people and, um, and particularly has this interest in Batman that he keeps deep-seated, but he just simply is pulling strings and making things happen for his own sort of amusement, and to me, it's just a real fascinating villain. Now let's get the old gang back together. I hear we have a big job to do. Keeping the Batman fresh for the third season isn't a difficult task when you've got great stories, we have great characters, great animation, great music put together in a way that not only resonates with the fans, but represents great filmmaking for television as well. We have been raising the bar for the Batman. When we started season three, we overall just had the mandate to make it just better, and I think it is by far uh, a better season than the rest. It's like somebody opened up the, the treasure chest of 60 years of great Batman stories and said, okay, here, pick and choose, and sort of retell it, you know, in a more condensed form, and, and that's been really neat. For season four, there's some stories that we wanted to tell that would 
push the envelope on, on the show altogether. We wanted to start taking things as more event style storytelling. In the past, we were pretty much just going through story through story. But this time, we really wanted to make it where you had to watch every episode. And we wanted to really please the fans and make our inner geeks happy. And I think we did that this season. For season four, we wanted to make every story sort of count. And every story sort of have a uh, hook to it that you could describe in one line. You know, we have the zombie episode. We have the alien invasion episode. And we just wanted every episode to be big and episodes that people could be excited about. The shows are getting better and better. I think the, the writing has always been great, but it's getting just even more interesting with the, the interpersonal dynamic between the characters as well as the villains. The storylines were terrific, and I, I think they did play out. And when you see the episodes, you, you see how this, the series evolved. And I, I think it is the best season yet. The driving force between season four, I would say, was obviously bringing Batman into a, a, a larger family with the addition of Robin. Ugh, a Robin? Like the bird? You know, kids my age get beat up for nicknames like that. You know, when we started off uh, season one of the Batman, Batman was a loner, and uh, we've been tracking his development as a crime fighter, and he's been relying on more and more people as he's gone along. And so season three focused on the addition of Batgirl, and you know, and the natural progression was the addition of Robin. We brought Robin in on season four, as opposed to previous seasons, because he was tied up in the Teen Titans show, so uh, it was time. Robin is an interesting character in that he brings an element of freedom and lightness to uh, Batman's world. Batman is a very grim, driven character who keeps a lot of his thoughts and emotions to himself. And the fact that he has any emotion to spare on this kid tells the reader or the viewer that he's not completely a lost soul himself. He becomes a father figure without question. Um, he's something of an older brother. He's, he's, he's everything to Robin. Robin started in the comic books in 1940. He was Dick Grayson, and later on down the line, there were two other Robins. Dick grew up to become uh, Nightwing, and there was Jason Todd, who didn't last too long, and then there was Tim Drake, who is the Robin today. But we went back to the original Dick Grayson story of his parents dying in a circus shakedown uh, situation. We always intended to, to use Dick Grayson as our Robin since this is the formative years of Batman and beginning of, of his family and, and we were just really excited to, to sort of get into that story because Robin is really you know deeply connected with Batman in a way that Batgirl never really is even though she's a good partner for Batman she's she doesn't have that same, you know, family tragedy element that connects Batman with Robin. Uh, who's the pixie? Robin, official partner to the Dark Knight. The relationship with Robin and Batgirl was, was very tumultuous in the beginning because it's basically like you have a new brother or a new sister and you're jealous. So we played it out more like a family where he was the, the stern father and those two were the the arguing kids all the time, which was fun because, again, the show needs to have humor, and that's a good, ripe source for humor. For better or worse, Batman has forced Robin and Batgirl to look upon each other as family members. And like uh, all families, there are good and bad things that come out of that relationship. And I think that that's one of the fascinating things to explore within the Batman universe. I think Robin helped focus the uh, you know, his character in the sense of him learning how to deal with others, forming the Bat family. Um, and, you know, learning to work well with, with people. I'm not one of those Arkham loners you're used to, Batman. I have a vast organization to deal with you. Memo to Black Mask. You're not the only one with an organization. How we decide to add new villains or just use the, ro the rogues gallery, what percentage it is, is mainly based on the stories we want to tell. If we have a bunch of new stories that don't exist with any villains that make any sense, we'll make up a new one. But if there's a story about how, how we want to test Batman's mind, we'll probably use the Riddler. It grows organically out of the story process. Uh, Mike Jelenic and I, we'd sit there and we'd hammer out the stories and we'd figure out a way to just make it work with you know, whatever we really need for that story. We definitely wanted going into the fourth season to throw in more villains. I think uh, the first three seasons were very Joker and Penguin heavy, and we didn't want to overuse those characters. So when they were featured, we wanted their appearances to, to count. So with that in mind, we, we looked at who would be cool, who haven't we used before. This season, we, we gave ourselves this mandate to make the best season ever. Part of that would be bringing back the villains that the fans would want to see, and Harley Quinn has always been a, a Batman villain that people love. Hi, hi, Gotham! Holly's back! <laughs> 
for a special farewell show. Everybody's been talking about, you know, bringing Harley Quinn in since day one. And, uh, you know, it's such a sacred character. And everybody was a little nervous about, you know, reinterpreting her. And we, we came up with a good solution. And it was uh, get Paul Dini to write the episode. You know, Paul Dini who created the character with uh, Bruce Timm. Harley Quinn's introduction into The Batman came out of a desire to put characters who had become iconic over the last 15 years uh, into the new show. So it seemed only natural that she should appear in the new show or some new version of her should appear. The Joker-Harley uh, relationship is, is one of the most dysfunctional relationships in comics and animated uh, TV. There's a little bit more of an equal footing in this new relationship between the Joker and Harley. She was never really the hench girl in, in this new version that she was in the old version. It's more like she and the Joker have a couple of fun nights on the town and he helps her pull off something that she wants to do. That immediately puts her more as a peer and an ally than a girl who scurries after him going, you know, yes, Mr. J. It's that demented relationship that people are fascinated with, her and the Joker. She's just funny. I mean, if you can put comedy into these crazy, action-packed, some would say violent situations, I mean, so much the better. I mean, she's just fun. I think she just appeals to people in so many different ways. She, she just, on the surface, is just, she's a cute girl and, you know, and everybody likes that. But at the same time, she's such a bad girl. And when it comes down to it, she can be absolutely vicious. And I think that's just fascinating to people. This, this is the end. This season, the arc of the show is it's introducing Batman to new players. And the first show was with Robin, and then we go on to have Robin and Batgirl and Batman be a team. And so Batman's world starts to open up until the very end where he meets the Martian Manhunter. For season four, we, want, we wanted to expand that uh, his role is, is bigger than the community of Gotham. He's a, like a, a superhero of the world, even of the galaxy, when, once we're throwing in you know, Martian Manhunter. And I think Martian Manhunter helps illustrate his expanding importance as a superhero. I'm not the only thing from outer space that's come to Gotham, but right now I'm the only thing that can stop it. Stop what? Invasion. Alien invasion. The end of your world. I mean, the stories are even bigger in scope this year. They really are. And, and uh, towards the end of the season, can't give anything away, but we get to work with uh, some other DC uh, characters in a really cool way. Yeah, you're going to watch through the end because the end of that season is just... Uh... As I read the scripts for the season, I thought the writers were doing a great job of really busting loose on interesting stories and interesting characters and bringing in interesting villains and just conceptually I thought their ideas were so good. I think uh, our whole crew is super excited about the season. I think it's the best season we've ever put out and we're super proud of it. We just love it. Seasons one through three were great seasons. Season four really built upon those three seasons, built upon that foundation, and elevated the show to another level. It's one of the favorite seasons of any show that I've ever worked on. The idea to go with team-ups this season grew out of last season. That season progressed where, in the end, Batman became a team player with John Jones, Manhunter from Mars. And at the very last shot, or just about the last shot of that two-parter, he was brought to the Watchtower, and John Jones introduced him to these five other superheroes. Those are the superheroes that we've used this season for the team-ups. Alan wanted to grow the Batman. I mean, he started off in, in basically his first year. Bruce Wayne was learning how to do it at that point. And each succeeding season, he grew a little bit more and more. 
And now he's become a team member. He's, he's bringing in uh, partners from who are other superheroes to work with him. Naturally, the dynamic of the series changed somewhat because, you know, Batman had always been sort of alone in his little world of Gotham. So we knew that bringing in other heroes was going to sort of drastically change the dynamic of the series. But we thought it was the only interesting thing to explore with Batman at this point was how he would work with other people that were his equal in, in one way or another. So why the sudden interest in Superman and Black Mask? Getting tired of me? He's working with Luthor. Luthor? The tone for the new season was set with that first episode with Batman and Superman teaming up together that was kind of a brave and the bold take towards this latest season. Brave and the Bold was a classic comic book where in every issue, Batman would team up with a cool character from the DC universe. So you had Hawkman one episode, Green Lantern, there's always some new hero coming along. As long as there have been superheroes, there has been the desire of fans to see those heroes teamed up with other heroes. The superhero team up is a classic. If you've got one hero who's popular, the comic book will sell even better if you've got another superhero in. And if you've got a whole gang of superheroes in, you've got the best selling book of all time which has been repeated over and over and over, as justified by the early days with Justice Society right up to the present day with DC's best-selling title, Justice League of America. I think what's cool about seeing heroes team up is just to see them, you know, how they're gonna interact with each other and, and deal with one, one another's personalities and how are their powers gonna work together. And of course, the most classic example of that would be Batman teaming up with Superman. The Justice League's about to have its first official meeting. I heard the Martian invited you you declined. I prefer to work alone. So did I, once. But I found out you never know when you might need a friend. Superman and Batman are difficult to work together. One is like a god and the other is immortal. And one's flying around and the other at best swings through the air. And they really don't belong together at all. But somehow people have responded to this relationship between them for years and years and years, and it continues going on. There's always been that bond between Superman and Batman, and, and to some degree, it isn't entirely logical that they would be friends. Originally, they teamed up under the title World's Finest, which is a pretty appropriate title for a book that uh, contains the world's best-selling superheroes. And their adventures continued for a number of decades until they suspended publication around the 80s. And then they, when they relaunched the book, it was known as uh, Superman Batman. In general, the Superman Batman team up is a team up of light and dark. Superman is a guy who was given this enormous gift and he wants to help people, he wants to share it. And Batman is uh, an embittered uh, vigilante. So when you combine those two personalities, th there's a lot of opportunity for, for writing interesting character stuff. This one fires yellow powder. Well, what gives, partner? You've prepared weapons to use against us. Only as a precautionary measure. Blame it on me, guys. I went temporarily renegade the last time we worked together. This might have saved a lot of time and trouble. I think, in general, a team-up offers an opportunity for a writer to explore the character. Inevitably, when you have a team-up, there's conflict between the two heroes. So that whenever you have conflict, that helps you show uh, more and more who the hero is and it gives you deeper insight into the hero and also the guest star. A lot of these relationships Batman has with the other Justice League characters is an edgy one. But when I was a kid, of course, everybody was a pal to each other. And when you read World's Finest, I mean, Superman and Batman were like brothers. And the Brave and the Bold, it seems to me that there wasn't that much conflict going on there. But nowadays, they like, they like to see superheroes get into it with each other. So you have to create you know, in, internal strife between the characters. Maybe there are two heroes who just don't like each other and who don't get along. So the problem is if they're paired up to take down a villain, they don't want to do it or they're not cooperating, they're a bigger threat to each other than the villain is. We always tried to keep a sort of healthy tension between the heroes coming into Batman's world and there's always a little bit of discomfort on Batman's part that there's sort of not enough room for both of us in this town. Batman's going to be working with these new people in his, his world. And so therefore, what are the conflicts with these characters to make it interesting? You know, what's Hawkman's, you know, personality compared to Batman? How does he operate? How does he do things? No more Dark Knights for you, Dark Knight. Ah! It's always a concern um, with these team-ups that Batman will end up becoming a bit secondary in the story. In some ways, you know, we are introducing these heroes to our audience, maybe for some of them for the first time but we always have to go back and make sure we maintain Batman as being the dominant character. It's his show. The way we kind of 
brought all these these villains and characters together. This came out of the story that was presented, but uh, there was definitely considerations on the writer's behalf on giving a good reason as to why the heroes were gonna team up. The heroes are not interchangeable. You have to find something unique about them and make the story pertain to that uniqueness in each case. For example, at the Green Lantern episode, he loses the ring. A story like that wouldn't be relevant to Green Arrow. I mean, he'd just get another bow and quiver. This wall doesn't belong here. Allow me. Concentrated acid. Phosphorus would have been faster. It's fun to see Batman in different situations where his genius brain and merely human brawn stack up perfectly against a more superpowered hero. And uh, usually it's Batman who's the deciding factor whether they win or not. You know, Batman is sort of a, even though he's a loner, he's sort of a natural leader because he knows everything. And everybody catches on that this guy's brain is working in areas they've never dealt with before. And so if for our Batman, it was just a natural progression that he dominated other characters because of his detective sensibilities. You know, he's just a brilliant man. All right, here's where we split up. If we're gonna get back your powers, we have to capture each android intact. We'll distract them while you attack. You'll only get one shot, so make it count. After four seasons of really developing our Batman character, to me, this season was really kind of the, the season where Batman became the full character of Batman and really joined the full world of the superheroes. And so, I think the thing I'm most happy about is that we actually were able to accomplish what we really set out to accomplish from the very beginning. Season five of The Batman was just a, a natural evolution of the series to the next level. We saw Batman working on his own as a loner in the first few seasons, and then as time went on, we introduced Batgirl and then Robin, and this was just the, the next stage, is to have him interact with other great DC characters. I would also say that one of the most satisfying things was finally bringing Superman into the series because it's something we, we just always dreamed of doing from the beginning. I'm happy with the season. I thought it, it ends on a high note and a lot of great work was done by a lot of wonderful writers and, and artists. We had terrific uh, recordings and it's one of the happier seasons of my career. Where's the kryptonite? Don't worry, we got it. I want it. You're not very trusting. In the Batman Superman team up, we tried to make Superman a little more distant, a little more alien. This is a guy who is pretending to be a human being, you know, so <laughs> that's the attitude we went for. And Batman is the one who is more open. You know, let's team up, let's get together, let's work together. I have this idea and Superman really has not that much interest in Batman whatsoever. I think I should pay Luthor a visit. Maybe we both should. He's not much for conversation, is he? Like you should talk. I think the main reason that the Superman-Batman team-ups work so well is that there's such a great contrast between these characters. Superman obviously is, is more, uh, you know, even just visually, he's very colorful. He's very, you know, forthright. Whereas Batman, of course, is classically, you know, a dark character that's in the shadows and very, very secretive and, and more of a detective. So their qualities really sort of balance with each other and they make something greater when they team together. They're just a really mythic team up. Designing all the characters for this new season and the past seasons has been like a dream come true to me. Especially this season since we got the chance to introduce Superman and new heroes from the DC Universe. I was very lucky in the sense that I had a lot of freedom in designing Superman. As a point of reference for me to design him, I think I was looking more into like the original Superman movie, Christopher Reeves and that sort of theme and that sort of universe, you know, the vibe. I wanted to keep him elegant. I wanted to keep him looking powerful and strong at the same time. You know, I always want to make sure that it stays true, you know, red cape, blue suit, S on the chest. I stayed away from like the S on the cape. I did do the curl on the head. I think that's one of the trademarks that do you have to be there. Now, tell me about this justice team of yours. League, Justice League. Told the Martian it sounded like a ball club.
Finally! I searched the whole city. It took me over an hour to find this place. Easy, kid. I'm on your side. Flash is one of my favorite, very favorite DC characters. Maybe next to Batman, he might have been my favorite comic when I was a kid. And I liked the Mirror Master a great deal. I wanted to do a Mirror Master story from the beginning. I brought him back in 1984 in the Super Friends series for a show which was similar to this show in the fact that people were being moved into a mirror world. But uh, Steve did something completely different with it for this show. And mirror Master is not easy because you'd have to draw mirrors and with the images moving in each mirror. And it's, he's a tough character for Saturday morning animation. And it worked out, it worked out really well. If we knew what he wanted, we could figure out how he intends to get it. Maybe he's building the world's ugliest chandelier. What are you doing? Pacing helps me think. The Batman um, Flash team up is kind of interesting. I mean, those two characters in a lot of ways, they're so different. The way that Superman and, and Batman fit together like puzzle pieces, I would say Flash and, and Batman sort of go by each other, you know, in, physically and figuratively. So they're not really teamed up so much as they're working concurrently. You know, obviously we played him quite comedically, which initially I was a little nervous about that, but I'm really happy with the way it turned out. For the design of the Flash, we wanted to stay with the traditional costume. The full red suit, the electric swoosh in the chest, you know, the little wings on the head. We kept them slim. You want to make sure that he feels like he's super fast and he's not too bulky because, you know, if he's too big, it might seem like he doesn't be able to move super fast. So. We wanted to stay with the current version of it. Everything's back to normal. Thanks. I should be thanking you. If you hadn't grabbed that portal ray, it was an impulsive move. Something I learned from you. Arrow? It's me, Batman. Robin, this is Green Arrow. Yeah, the arrows and the greenness kind of give it away. Originally, when we were talking about the Green Arrow show, I think we wanted to play up the similarities and the fact that Batman was irritated that his ideas were being usurped. Because, you know, Green Arrow is sort of a knockoff of a Batman. Although in the, what, the 70s, they made him uh, ultra-liberal and he fought for social causes. And there's that edge to him in our show. People are getting sick around here, and it's because of that dirtbag Bruce Wayne. Dirtbag? If some kind of illness is being caused by Wayne Labs, I guarantee you Bruce Wayne doesn't know about it. Bet he does. And I know who he's working with, too. And Stan Berkowitz, who wrote three of the shows this season, I wrote that one. He's one of the darker writers of Saturday Morning. Green Arrow and Batman are the two closest comic heroes you can get. Green Arrow. Even as a child, I said, hey, you know, Green Arrow's just Batman with a, with a bow and arrow. This is cool. Gives you distance. Huh. The arrows are really batarangs. I mean, they move a little faster and a little straighter and a little further, but they still are batarangs. I used Robin to, to sort of point out the differences between the two. Otherwise, I think they might have been too similar. They, they had similar motivations. For the designer of Green Arrow, we wanted to stay with the more traditional version of him. You know, the green suit, the you know blonde goatee, and the mustache with the little like Robin Hood hat. Uh, obviously, you have your, your bow and arrows. You know, so a lot of that stuff is stay true to what the fans know about him. With a lot of these characters, we wanted to stay as true to the to the most traditional versions of them. You know, we want to make sure that when, when the fans look at the show, you know, we don't give them something completely new and something that they're, you know, maybe they're not familiar with. Over here, guys. Come on. Green Lantern, you're really here. I am such a fan. The idea of the Green Lantern story was that in desperation, Hal has to uh, send his ring to Batman for protection because he can't keep from having it taken by uh, Sinestro. Sinestro's beating him up so much. Find Batman, save 
with him. There were some internal discussions about how m much Batman should handle the ring. And the thing is, Penguin handles it, but it, pretty badly because he just can't keep in control of it. But Batman is a guy of tremendous willpower, so he should be able to handle the ring. But if he handles the ring with ease, then what's the purpose of Hal Jordan? And we decided that we would just, we would limit the handling of the ring by Batman a lot. In the script, there was even less than what ended up on film because the storyboard artists decided that they would, they wanted something with Batman and the ring. So how was it, using that ring? Not my style. The really fun part uh, for, uh, for us with uh, Green Lantern and, and, and Batman and that team up is that, you know, Green Lantern of all the characters, maybe excepting Superman, he's such a bigger than life character and he's off on galactic adventures all the time and he's on Earth part of the time and he walks with a certain arrogance being a cocky test pilot. So we thought the fun part with that was the way that Robin sort of hero worships Green Lantern I think really is a great way of, of setting up the contrast between the two characters. It was just fun to see Batman actually get a little bit a little bit jealous of this. With the design for Green Lantern, we wanted to stay true to the more iconic version of him is, you know. We have the, the green suit with the, the black uh, sleeves, the white gloves, obviously the Green Lantern logo on the chest. We also did this cool little effect around him, this little green glow when he flies around and he's supercharged and he's using his ring to fight Sinestra. <laughs> I must admit, I underestimated you. Really? As a matter of fact, I think we're a lot alike. You mean stubborn? I was going to say we have enormous willpower, but stubborn works too. I'm impressed. Your setup here is not that much different from police headquarters back on Thanagar. More Earthbound, of course. The team up that I worked on um, specifically was the Batman Hawkman episode. And we have the history, you know, the whole thing with Thanagar and stuff like that. There was all this backstory. Tried to incorporate that at the start, but realized, you know, we just don't have time. So instead, let's just, you know, have the dynamic of Hawkman. Who is he? We played him as like an international policeman who's come to take care of Shadow Thief, which is in the, the episode. We approached him as literally like a professional police officer from this other planet. To me, Hawkman is, a, is sort of, he's a really fun action character. You know, the way he swings that mace around, he sort of naturally fell into almost like a swashbuckling barbarian type of figure, and, and so we had a lot of fun with that. Can someone tell me what Shadow Thief thought he was doing? Keeping us away from the real crime. Huh? Anyone need a lift? I had this idea, since we are going to be in the air with Hawkman, that, that the villains actually steal a building and, and lift it away. And then uh, while it's being taken away, Batman and Robin get in the building, and the technology that's being used suddenly starts going awry, and the building starts to turn. So you have a fight in a turning building. Suddenly it hit me, and I just said, yes, this is a, this is a 6 to 11-year-old idea. This is perfect for my audience. Let's go with this. For the design of Hawkman, I wanted to make this huge, massive guy that, you know, he'll be able to hold up this enormous wings that he has, you know, on his back. We wanted to make him very powerful. I think Hawkman is maybe not one of the most used heroes in animated versions of the DC Universe, but, you know, we had a lot of fun designing him for the show. The Radiant Analyzer shows one element unknown to Earth with anti-gravity properties I've never seen before. I have. It's called the Nth Element. It's part of my suit. It's what gives me my strength and flying powers. It's incredibly potent and unstable. If this is what they're after, all of Gotham is in jeopardy. Batman of the Golden Age had his roots in pulp fiction, was a fearsome character, and it sort of made sense that in year three, he would be a more feared character. Our series really tried to lean into the idea that Batman was the core and Bruce Wayne 
is sort of the mask. Hello, ladies. These are the younger days of Bruce Wayne when he is still finding his way as the Batman. The idea of a Batman that's not quite as secure. No! I'm not helping the law. I'm just breaking it. That's interesting as a human being to watch. It's like, is there something that's there that we should lean into? Tried to guide Bruce Wayne, and he found his way to be the Batman. I don't know whether that was ever Alfred's intention. As a father, you reach a point when you're no longer in charge of your kids. No doubt. Make way, make way. Batman is now struggling with the rise of supervillains. The level of criminality increases exponentially into a weird, dangerous new frontier. We're getting feedback from the world around Bruce of how he's going to create this Batman persona. I really believe the Bat's helping Gotham, even if he is on the wrong side of the law. That was a, a texture that we haven't seen a lot of in other Batman stories. I was so excited. The first person I called was my older brother, Dominic. So when I got the job, I called and I said, dude, I'm Batman. offered the opportunity to do a new take on Batman, and uh, it was exciting, but it was also somewhat terrifying. And if it wasn't the Adam West series, or comic books, or Batman the Animated Series, you didn't have much to go to. You really, it didn't exist yet. It was actually a mandate not to repeat the Timverse uh, version of Batman. We were seeing a Batman putting an end to the mobsters and seeing the rise of the monsters. The circus is in town! You should never have put yourself in my sights again. Christopher Nolan was doing Batman Begins at the same time on a parallel track. We had to avoid certain things uh, that uh, they were doing. The writing team, the producers all had a really interesting vision for this uh, new breed of villains that were coming about in Gotham as a response to, to Batman's arrival. Smiles, people! Smiles! To me, I took my cue just from the, the animation when I first saw the character, and his nose was slightly punched in. And I, and I always thought that was interesting, you know, He'd been boxing as a kid, and I just love that little detail that they had his nose kind of a little smashed in, because he's a good-looking guy, but he's got a little bit of something-something. I think anime and the DNA of anime that is in Jeff Matsuda's art style really became the portal to the attitude and the tone and the storytelling. Bruce Timm's design theory, right, is to simplify and to dummy-proof things. Jeff's design theory is, I don't want to do something that's normal, you know? I want to use shapes that are distinct. Those more extreme visual interpretations of the character lend themselves to, to weirdness, and it gave us license, I think, to push the sort of comedic, uh, bizarre elements of the show in a way that Batman the Animated Series couldn't as a more realistic, gritty drama. And I personally like anime, and I like the fact that it was used sparingly. And I think what it did for the, the villains, which I like so much, is it let them be broader vocally, and yet it still fit in with the good guys, the heroes. It didn't seem like they were two different cartoons. They did seem like they lived in the same world. Lights out, Batman. Honestly, the choreography, I, I hand it to our directors. Sung and uh, also Brandon Vietti and Sam Liu, you know, they all sort of set the pace for the anime style. Call me Penguin, a flightless bird, but one with style. Penguin was just Penguin, and, and Brandon's like, this has got to have something because it's, it's kind of just jokey and it's kind of plain, you know what I mean? And so he was like, I'm going to make Penguin into this master fighter. 
We knew Penguin always had umbrellas as weapons before, but we wanted to find a way to take that to the next level. The actors have to really learn how to do fight waller and how to throw punches, take punches. If you put an H on the front of the sound, it sounds like you are doing the action. For example, throwing a punch, <laughs> taking a punch, put a vowel on the front of it. <laughs> That's a U. Ah, that's an A. Trying to ramp up their physicality in combat and then film yeah. that uh, in, in an anime way. And that would really bring something new and different to the action of the Batman. <laughs> you should learn to play nice, Penguin. Superheroes remain attractive to people as they grow into adulthood, and those adults demand stories that are more sophisticated and more interesting. So the writing needs to meet that challenge uh, to, to entertain those people. Because we weren't being, you know, as dark as Vitaz, with the, the Timverse, uh, I think serialization and storytelling was a way to hook them in. I thought that gave it a great color and depth that is part of the hallmark of the show. And I think The Batman was one of the shows that was at the forefront of that transition from episodic to serialization and superhero storytelling. Storytelling doesn't just stop with what's on the script page. It's how it's translated by the actors visually and uh, all the way to sound design and music. Thomas Chase Jones did a wonderful job getting into our heads about the tone. Being at Warner Brothers, uh, we uh, had wonderful resources, and uh, we had a terrific music department who, when we started talking about uh, theme songs, gave us a list, and The Edge was on it. We heard the demo that he did, and to me it was perfect. They came up with a spooky guitar that was the perfect complement for the Batman himself. When we talk about making the character of Bruce Wayne more relatable, humanized, the key was really Alfred. He's the one person that Bruce Wayne can actually say the things, uh, talk about the things that really trouble him. I should give it up. Sir, I would be more than delighted to encourage you to hang up the cape and cowl out of concern for your general health and welfare. But you would only hold it against me once your fever broke and you came to your senses. As year three, a younger Batman, I think Alfred is still sort of doting. He's still protective of Bruce. I was less interested in just retelling the Bane story and the story of Bruce's convalescence, but that A story became a vessel to delve into Bruce's past and crime alley. Alfred's there to back him up and say, keep going. And so he, he served all these different purposes. I had not worked with Alistair Duncan before this series. What was so clear right away was that he understood the character. Or perhaps it's your way of seeking what the Batman cannot have, the approval of Gotham's finest. Within that gravitas was also a certain levity. Yes, yes, I'm fired, I know. He had a, a fondness and a love for Bruce and Bruce back to him. Ellen and Ethan represent a great point of personal contact for Bruce Wayne. It creates a great point of conflict for Bruce and, and makes him wonder if he's doing the right thing. I'm sure the Batman means well, but he's still a vigilante. I think a key theme of our series is the exploration of the idea of vigilantism. You are not one to bask in glory, Master Bruce. The idea of your child, your mentee, becoming a vigilante is awful, particularly for somebody like Alfred, who has such a strong code of ethics. But that's what his ward has chosen. And every day, he must worry that Bruce is going to cross the line. I don't believe it. Being the cerebral hero that he is, he's the perfect character to kind of delve into these issues of what is right, what is wrong. Mild-mannered Olympic hero by day, butt-kicking Batwoman by night. Daniel Judovitz gave Batgirl a different energy. 
we had already set up Batman as being a younger Batman, a younger Bruce Wayne, and now we got a young character who we could see her point of view on the world around her and how these supervillains were affecting her and how she saw the Batman. You set up Barbara right away as a conflicted character who's looking for the right way forward to do the right thing. What gives our series a layer of complexity is the way we see the two detectives go about their different ways of exploring the idea. We're chasing two perps. One's a criminal, the other's still a vigilante. Hey, Ethan. There's lots of duality in Batman in general. We didn't have Two-Face to play, but we had Clayface. No! Those episodes were particularly interesting to me personally. You know, your best friend just turned into a monster and a villain. <laughs> I made you who you are. Said so yourself. And from where I dangle, you make a better villain than vigilante. <laughs> Batman. Ah! I'm super proud of the work we did with uh, Oxwald Cobblepot and the Penguin. I am a Cobblepot! That character has a mouth that goes from ear to ear, and I think that probably helped Tom figure out what kind of voice he wanted to do, because you've got to have the voice match the character. We looked at it more as Oswald as a threat to Bruce Wayne, so we envisioned Oswald Cobblepot as the anti-Bruce Wayne where uh, Bruce Wayne is wealthy and, and powerful. Uh, Cobblepot has lost his family's fortune and is poor. Show me the money! <laughs> and never play with a full deck! <laughs> Our concept was that Joker was almost like Gotham City's collective moral rot personified. <laughs> this idea that he was sort of part of Gotham, part of all of us. One bad day can define a character, or for that matter, one moment can define any of us. Well, in my case, a rotten day and a chemical bath. <laughs> in Bruce's case, of course, the murder of his parents was incredibly shocking and formative. But I think that for all of us, these Things that happen to us, for better and for worse, shape us. Bring it on, rodent boy! His villains have a very rich psychological history, and they're all very unique, and they challenge different aspects of Batman's own psychology. Psych! What massive! That kind of ties into a good personal stake for Batman or, or Bruce Wayne, so that it's not just a villain threatening Gotham City. The villain is threatening characters that you care about. So what took you? I feel like we broke a lot of talent on our show. We had Brandon Vietti and Sam Liu, who have continued to make great DC Universe films. Christopher Yost, who has gone on to uh, have a terrific career in features. I think that the past informs the present and the future, and I hope that our series affected the creators of today, you know, they might have watched it in their youth. The love of comics, science fiction, fantasy, horror, and all that genre stuff uh, has gone mainstream, and it's acceptable for people of all ages to enjoy this stuff. The series was from 2004 to 2008, but then every year I'm doing something to do with Alfred and he's coming back into my life. That allows me to actually be slightly different with Alfred. What a pleasure it was to watch this series again after not having seen it since practically we made it. And I'm so very pleased that I actually can look at the whole thing and, and, and it's even better than I remember. A lot of us that sort of grew up with these kind of things are now in these positions where we can kind of like green light these type of things or, you know what I mean, or work on these kind of things. I just want to do it right so that for those people that are discovering Batman for the first time through something you've worked on, and that hopefully they fall in love with Batman and his rogues gallery and Gotham City and all of the characters that come along with Batman, just as you did when you were younger. Any good mythology uh, the stories serve to illuminate psychology or help us understand or make sense of the world. And I think the Batman was able to do that.
spiffy costume. 